It's perfect timing. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? So let me switch over here. So we're um respect everybody's time so um well thank you all for coming out to sustainable claremont's dialogue series it's been a minute since we've had our last one um uh, the last one we had in person at last name brewing and then before that um it was a virtual one around earth day so typically in fall and winter is we, when we start doing more of these and so we're happy to have um Britt here tonight to lead us in some great botanical illustration um, before we get to it, though, a couple of quick announcements, some information about a program that Sustainable Claremont's working on, and then I'll throw it to Carrie Baldwin, our Green Crew Program Manager, to do some more introductions. So really quickly, just a rundown of a really busy October that we have coming up. Um, so we're going to be at the Claremont Gallery. Uh, that's the artisan and craftsman um, show at the Packing House on every Friday except for one, the 18th, um, during the month of October. So come find us there and buy some cool arts and crafts from local makers. Um, October 6th, we'll be at the farmer's market, giving away free trees to Claremont residents. We have our auction for our, our gala, our fundraiser, going live on October 14th. And on the 24th, we have our annual gala. Um, we've got new swag um, for the fall season, and that'll be on social and on our website. So be on the lookout for that. Um, once we get to the, the, the presentation, um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the little chat box um, or save them until the end. Um, and, and we'll get to you there just so we're not um, interrupting uh, as the presentation's going. All right, one more quick thing. Um, this is not too late, though it feels like a little bit too late. Um, so we are helping do some um, outreach for a program called the Power Saver Rewards Program. Um, and the basics of this program are that um, when there's a large demand for power in California, when it's super hot and everyone's cranking their ACs and washing machines and all that at the same time, um, there's often a, a chance that we're going to have too much demand on the power grid. Um, and this that could trigger something called a flex alert. That's when the state tells people to, to cool it on their, their power use. And so there's a program called the Power Savers Rewards Program, where if you enroll and you cut your power a bit during that period, you could earn money credits back on your energy bill. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll drop the link to um, enroll in that program if you're so inclined in the chat box once we get started. Um, but it's a great program. There's like no strings attached. But if you help out during these um, peak demand cycles, uh, then it takes the, the strain off the grid and it, it sort of helps everybody out. So be on the lookout for that. And Carrie, I will throw it to you. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and make uh, Britt the host. All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Carrie. I'm the program manager for our urban forestry program, Green Crew. Um, Green Crew works with the surrounding cities in the area to support our urban forests through planting trees as well as providing educational opportunities. Trees help combat our climate crisis and provide us with many great benefits such as cleaner air and cooler temperatures. Um, so far this year, with the help of over 200 volunteers, Green Crew has planted 140 trees in disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities in Montclair. Um, and this project is supported by funding from Tree People, Cal Fire, and the Proposition 68 Parks Envir Environment and Water Bond Act of 2018. And so we're excited to present this workshop for you today on sketching street trees. Um, and so during this dialogue, botanical illustrator Brittany Brigard is going to be guiding you through the process of drawing a few selected common street trees. She'll cover basic drawing techniques, discuss the unique characters of each tree and provide a step-by-step -step guide to sketching various species. And um, Brittany, there's gonna be time for questions after each species section, cor correct? Um, probably at the end. At I didn't end. actually get a chance to uh, run through the whole thing. Hopefully I have enough time for everything. Okay, no problem. So at the end then. Um, and then just to give an introduction to Brittany, uh, Brittany's a botanical illustrator with work published in the scientific journal Madrono. Her pieces have been displayed at venues in California, Arizona, and Panama. 
And Brittany teaches workshops on botanical art, illustration, and nature journaling. She has a BS in botany and is working on a master's at Arizona State University on the effects of wildfire on Sonoran desert vegetation. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Brittany. Thanks, Carrie and Stuart and everybody with Sustainable Claremont. I'm glad to be here and I appreciate the work that you do. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, no, not the right button. Okay. So uh, we'll be doing uh, three street trees today. Um, I'm going to play a series of videos of me drawing the leaves and a tree. I'll use a marker on the printouts that I've made to break down the subject matter into the basic shapes. And then these resulting guidelines will simplify the drawing process by forcing me to focus on proportions. Uh, this is great for beginners because it builds the most important aspect of drawing, which is capturing proportions accurately. So some basic drawing tips. Um, the, your overall perspective, I want you to think about it as being a joyful process of exploration and observations. Don't focus on how good your drawing is or is not because there is no right or wrong in this kind of process. It's more about learning about the plant and probably yourself. So when you start to draw, I recommend spending time warming up, doing some sketches, drawing random little shapes is what I like to do. Um, it's important to observe your subject matter closely. This is a really significant part of art is, is being able to uh, observe something and accurately or provocatively or however, you know, express it. You want to look for basic geometric shapes, like I've said, because uh, that will help you get proportion correct. Um, and then you always want to do proportion before you add the detail. It's awful to add detail to an image that turns out to, you know, be wonky. And then the biggest thing is practice. Practice, practice, practice. It makes perfect. Um, so here's the list of suggested supplies that was included for this workshop, and I've highlighted the uh, Prismacolor non-photo blue pencil because that is a really useful tool for sketching. Um, it doesn't show up on photos and videos, and that's why I've used um, red in all of my videos so that you can see what I'm doing, but it's a really light blue pencil that is hard to see and it, and you can really easily add stuff on top of that. And so it's a super useful tool. Okay, so the first tree that we're gonna talk about is the Western Redbud, which is a native tree to California. It's a short a shrub or a short tree because it doesn't get very tall and is fa commonly found in riparian areas. Um, Indigenous Californians use the twigs to weave baskets, and then the bark also provides a faint reddish dye to finished basketry. Here are some pictures of the overall shape of the tree. They are gorgeous and make excellent uh, ornamentals with those uh, bright flowers in the spring and their um, the pods are nice, the, the bark is nice, and I especially love the leaves. I think they're very cute. Um, we will be drawing, or, or I will show the image, and you can if you would like to draw along uh, this picture of the leaf on the left. Um, the videos are sped up, so it's, it's not real time. Uh, feel free to sketch as you want to. Okay. So hopefully this video plays well.
Oops. Okay. Um, okay, the next tree is the California sycamore. Um, I especially love sycamores, they're gorgeous trees. They um, are also usually found in wet areas, so canyons, river, waterways, riparian areas. Um, they can get very tall, uh, 80 plus feet. They are deciduous in the winter, as are the red buds. Um, and they also uh, tend to lose their leaves following the growth of the anthro, uh, anthra, anthracnose fungus, which contributes to the gnarled shape of their trunks and branches. And I actually didn't know that until I uh, looked up, you know, was using information to put this project together. Um, and that's one of my favorite things about these trees is their, their gnarly shape. Uh, so it's really interesting to know that that's a, a fungus causing that. And then the velvety leaves are some of the largest made by any uh, native California tree. The bark is another gorgeous aspect of them. They vary a lot, but it's usually uh, will come off in, in plates and sheets. And here are the leaves and um, some of the flowering and fruiting uh, and fluorescence. Okay, and for our second video.
And then uh, our last tree for today is the Chinese pistache. Uh, these are not native to California, but they are um, a really beautiful tree, especially their fall colors. I love uh, the colors that they change. They reach about 40 feet and are resistant to the oat root, uh, oat root fungus. So here's a picture of their bark. It's very nice. And then as you can see, they just turn this beautiful, bright orange red kind of color before they lose their leaves. And then here's a picture of the fruits on the left and uh, the small flowers that are um, not showy that they get in the spring before they leaf out. And then here are the leaves. This is a compound leaf, meaning that um, that whole picture of a leaf is one thing, one leaf, and then every individual leaf is a leaflet. Oh. I have the wrong video in here. Um. I'm going to do a different share. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay. Um. All right, um, can everyone see the video? Cool.
right. Um, that is that. And we are uh, basically done with the videos. Let me get back to uh, PowerPoint. Oh, I got something in my eye. Um, so yeah, I think I saw one question in the chat and at this point we um, are available for uh, chatting, drawing, asking whatever kind of questions we want. Um, okay. So what is your reason for using the non-photo blue pencil, Ty asks. So I use that because it's a really light colored pencil that I like to get the that first sketch done with. So everything that I drew in red in the videos, I would normally do with the photo blue. And then I would go over with the graphite or the ink, whatever kind of drawing I'm doing. Um, it's it's just a useful illustration tool. And, and um, I especially like it for nature journaling because I can uh, get those quick lines down and not have to worry about really using light graphite because graphite tends to smear a little more also than the photo blue pencil does. Looks like there's another question in the chats. What's your favorite tree you've ever drawn? It's from Roberto. Um, that's a good question. I tend to like to draw pine trees um, because they're they're sometimes simple and that's that's nice. Uh, I, I do tend to find drawing like a whole tree to be intimidating and I will usually focus on like the leaves and everything. Um, but I probably right now my my favorite tree is just the Arizona sycamore which is uh pretty similar to the the California one Rick can you give us like a rundown just like of the gear that you use or prefer and like you know from the the markers that you have here to the paper if if somebody is like wanting to get into this and makes a trip to Blick or something what should they be picking up yeah um so I tend to use whatever kind of sketch pad is available to me. Their paper comes in like a range of weights and sizes and um, textures and all sorts of different things. Uh, but if you're going to be taking it outside and journaling, you know, probably just get something cheap, but it's up to you. Um, for this sketch pad, I'm just using like a, you know, nothing special in terms of the sketch pad. Um, the, I specifically like to use, uh, two types of pencils, HB and 7B. Uh, those are, they refer to like the texture and therefore, or how hard it is basically. So the harder the graphite is, the lighter it will be on your page and the softer the graphite is, which is the 7B end, the darker it's going to be. And that is what I used for all of these uh, videos was the 7B so that you could really see what I was doing. Um, and that's another thing to just experiment with whatever kinds of pencils uh, that you prefer. I like Stadler is a good brand for pencils um, and other, I like their pens, their ink pens. Um, Faber-Castell is another brand that makes good ink pens. Um, on the cheaper side is uh, Micron, and I also like Micron um, for pen and ink stuff. Um, and then, yeah, just an eraser, a ruler. Of course, I always have a ruler when I'm sketching. Um, that's partly the scientist and botanical illustrator in me, but it's a really useful tool for artists of all kinds. Um, Great. And then, of course, uh, a good pack that like stores all your things and it makes it easy for you to use them when you're out and about and something that you can grab easily, go out and, and work with it. If you want to be drawing regularly, I recommend having 
a space set out for that where you can just go and start working and it's always there readily available so that you don't have to put effort into putting things away and taking them out. I, I think when you're going through the the three um, different examples and the particularly the two leaves, it's so helpful to see, you know, drawing over the overlay on the, the printout so you can see sort of the contour lines and how to kind of transcribe that and 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 put it down on paper when you're sort of out in the field um, uh, drawing. Do you, will you still do that on like a leaf you find on the ground or will you like, do you have a different strategy for when you're um, not drawing from photo, but drawing from life? How do you kind of reconcile those two strategies? Yeah, um, I will usually find a leaf on the ground. Um, sometimes I'll, you know, take a clipping of a tree um, to sit with it so that I can use the look up close and get the details. Um, sometimes you don't have that, so you do have to scrounge on the ground for uh, the leaves, old leaves, old fruits can be really helpful and, and tell you, uh, you know, identification information as well as ecological information if you just look around the base of the tree for uh, what kind of structures it's dropping. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Um, it's people often will use their hands as like guides to to use to try to determine perspective when they're looking at something far away and then putting it on it on it on their paper. Right, sure. Okay, great. And we've got an, a question from Doug here, fellow artist from the Art Center. Um, what is your technique for sketching your leaves on the last tree example? So when you were sort of doing those textures, I guess. Yeah, it was kind of uh just scribbly sort of stippling textures i was using that's the just the 7b pencil the whole time and i would press more firmly to get darker and uh build up layers to also get it darker and then when i wanted the lighter it was just uh you know very gently rubbing it across the page um it tended to get a little more scribbly on those lighter leaves and the darker leaves are sort of more distinct shapes um is that does that answer the question, or were you wanting to talk about uh, the the leaf itself, the that compound leaf that I showed? Doug, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and answer, but um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Doug. I no, that was that was what I was thinking about was the those leaves on the the full the full tree you were doing, and yeah, it was a really neat technique how you like highlighted the dark areas of the tree and then made those the the first ones you drew and then did the lighter ones and I was thinking did you you probably like were you thinking about the that leaf structure when you were doing the little like indication of the leaves because it was just real yeah. neat to see it, it sped up like that but I was like oh, I, wonder, I wonder what she's thinking about with those leaves <laughs> yeah they're definitely in the back of my mind is I know sort of what these leaves look like. Obviously it's a photo that I'm working from. Um, so it's, you know, there's not a lot of detail there necessarily, but yeah, I, I specifically used the stippling because they have these compound leaves. So they've got a lot of, of leaves. Well, thank you. Carrie. Yeah, and then Carrie. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I'll stop. Oh, no worries. Carrie uh, asks, can you talk a little bit more about tips and techniques you use, like maybe looking for different types of shapes? Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to say. You, you sort of just get a feel as you practice over time about what shapes you're looking at. And um, I wonder if I could annotate. So like this leaf here, you've kind of, you've just got an oblong shape, but you've also got uh, the twist in there. And um, I'm thinking about that oblong shape before I'm thinking about the details of the twist. Um, and excuse my, uh, 
you know, drawing with a, a mouse. Um, and then that's, you know, sort of the shape of the leaf and you've got the, the other bits to think about. Um, does that kind of <laughs> help? <laughs> Oops. Brit, yeah, I know Brit, I noticed in your first one I saw like a lot of triangles you know you circled around and then I saw a bunch of triangles yeah. so I don't know if that was something that you keep in mind too when you're working on that yeah triangles um are a, often a pretty convenient shape I tend to like leaves that have that uh like the lobed leaf here and then the little cat face um those those are often the ones that I find the most fun to draw because they're more interesting, I guess. For somebody who's who's wanting to get out there and try to start doing this, um, do you have like a suggestion of like, should they sort of start small, like, you know, with leaves or what, what, should they go out to the Botanic Garden and just try to do everything or where's like a good starting point for somebody who wants, you know, is interested in this? Um, I would say small is the easiest way to start. Um, you know, if you've got a place in your backyard or on your street, like somewhere that's easy for you to go to and draw some, you know, the plants out there, that's a great place to start and get some practice. If you've got house plants, they're fun to draw. Um, and then it is great to go to the botanic gardens. I always recommend going to botanic gardens, going out into nature and hiking and drawing outside. Um, I find it really rewarding. And uh, I have pretty distinct memories of a lot of the trips that I've taken where I've drawn on them because I took that time to sit and observe. Um, and so, yeah, just figure out what medium, I guess, works for you and what you like to do, and then uh, take that with you everywhere kind of thing. Brit, what's your background training in this? Have you, like, for art, like, how can you let us all know how long you've been doing it? And if you've specifically been studying, like, illustration or fine art, or what got you to this point? Obviously, your stuff is amazing. No, oh, thank you. Um, I have been drawing most all of my life as far as I can remember and um, got into botany as an undergrad at uh, Northern Arizona University. Um, and that is when I started doing scientific illustration. I was lucky enough to have uh, be hired by a professor there to do some illustrations and that is what got me into doing that kind of work. Um, but I, and I've taken art classes throughout my life and I'm always interested in that kind of thing. I don't have, um, and there's like certificates you can get in scientific illustration. Um, I have not received those. They are expensive and there's not that many jobs for illustrators. Um, it is not a full-time job and I have carpal tunnel, which makes it hard to draw. Um, but it is definitely really rewarding and um, it's, I find at this point it's with the pain in my hands that I tend to spend more time observing, which is what you are told to do is to spend a lot of time looking at your subject. Um, and that has actually been kind of nice to, to at least I'm, I'm, I'm still enjoying the drawing when I can do it kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. I, I've got two follow up questions to that um, uh, that I don't want to forget. The first is um, I feel like medical illustrations are always so amazing, and and I feel like it's such a part of of that world. Why, for like somebody on the outside, it seems like one might just use photographs instead of illustrations. I'm glad that's not the case. But um, how how is um, like illustration sort of embedded in the botany community? Like how how did that happen and and why and you know, for all the good reasons? Can you can you touch on that? Yeah, it's um, it's really important. Obviously, when photographs weren't a thing, uh, and a drawing is a good way to 
ex, you know, share information about a plant with other people. Um, botanists have for a long time collected and pressed and dried plants. And those are like a foundational aspect of botany. And I kind of consider illustrations to be an idealized pressed plant in that it focuses on what is significant for taxonomy about that plant. Whereas a photograph is, um, they're very useful. Like I am a proponent of having both, like always. Ideally all plants have, you know, we've got tons of pictures and illustrations of them. But um, it's, the perspective in an image is off. You can't know exactly uh, the size of things, whereas an illustration is very meticulously measured as so that everything is the proper size and proportion. Um, and like I said, it really, you focus on what is uh, like the core parts of the plant that humans think are important, I guess, for scientific identification. That makes so much sense now that you you say that. That's super insightful. Thank you. Um, I have one more sort of related question to that, which is um, since you're sort of in both of these these worlds, the illustration world or art world and the botany world, like how do you how do these um, play off one another? So like what like insights about botany do do you think you have that are unique to you as an illustrator that maybe other botanists might not pick up on? Like, do you, you must recognize certain patterns that, you know, maybe are attention to detail or, you know, whatever it is, and maybe vice versa. Like, how does the botany inform, like, your your work as an illustration, other than just the subject matter? Yeah, well, knowing botany really helps me uh, accurately draw plants. Um, I also like to draw insects, but I know my insect drawings are, like, just not as well informed as my plant drawings. Um, and it, so that's nice. Uh, I know, I kind of, I know plants. And so I, I have a feeling for them and can um, often get uh, artful sketches that sort of, I feel, encompass the plant as well as do the scientific illustrations that encompass the plant in a kind of different way. Um, when it comes to the art influencing the science, um, I am a huge proponent, proponent of uh, STEAM instead of STEM, so including art in uh, that acronym, and uh, because I think they're really the same thing. Science is an art, and art is a science, really. Um, the... It, I think I have a really good eye for color. I love color and I think I am pretty good at picking out particular colors in the landscape and finding plants that way. Um, and yeah, I think I'm just observant. Like the drawing has, is practiced my observ I, I practice my skills of observation when drawing. And so, um, yeah, I think that, uh, it makes it goes hand in hand. I, you know, it's sort of a chicken or the egg situation of was I a scientist or an artist first? It's it's the same in my mind. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't want to be hogging all the time here. Let's see. While we're waiting, is there anything you like hate to to draw or illustrate, Brittany? <laughs> Um, honestly, I, trees are like not something I draw very often. I yeah. love tiny little plants. <laughs> but, uh, funny. Nice. Well, what is it? Is it just like getting into the nitty gritty of like the detail of something really small or? Yeah, I, I would love to one day do like massive paintings of tiny plant parts, um, and just have, you know, a ton of detail and, and like bring people into that world of detail that not a lot of people get to look at right right well when you do that you're gonna have to come back for another dialogue for us because i would <laughs> see that 
All right, great. Do we have any more questions or anything? Carrie, Doug, anyone, Ty? No. Okay, well, I think we've just about um, used up our time. Um, anything else, Brittany, you'd like to leave us with where we could maybe follow you or uh, any other words of wisdom for us? Um, just keep on making stuff and keep on looking at plants and nature is, is what I'd like to leave you with. Um, I, a lot of my handles on social media are just my name, Brittany Burgard or Brittany E. Burgard, if you're curious about looking that stuff up. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Carrie, did you have anything else to add before we sign off? No, nope, just thanks everybody for coming. Thank you for Brittany. And um, yeah, that's it. All right. Great. Well, everyone have a great night and uh, we'll see you at the next one. I do. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>